Thank you for joining us. My name is Theron Stanky, and I am honored to introduce you to our team of clinical educators and local prosthetists and orthotists. It is our firm belief that patients living with limb loss receive the best outcome possible when we take the team approach to their care. The relationship between the prosthetist, therapist, physician, and other treating medical professionals starts and ends with open communication and education. We learn just as much from you as we hope that you learn from us. And it is our goal to make these presentations a conversation, not a lecture. We sincerely thank you for your support and devotion to this specialized patient population. Hi, my name is Renee Van Veld, and I'm a physical therapist. I work for an orthotics and prosthetics company in the Midwest. I do a lot of education presentations to both practicing therapists and students as well as consulting with our practitioners for patients with lower extremity amputations. I worked for over 20 years as a physical therapist at a level one trauma hospital locally, mostly in the outpatient department, treating patients with amputations as frequently as possible. I also taught in a local DPT university program for 14 years, teaching content on wound care and amputations, as well as serving as the director of clinical education. Now, my passion is continuing with education. I like to help as many people with the amputations as possible by training therapists. I enjoy training therapists who have been therapists for a long time, who treat amputees routinely, as well as helping people who don't treat amputees very often to feel comfortable with this content. I want them to feel like they have the, the words to ask the right questions of their local practitioners for best patient outcome. Hi, uh, this in service is about K levels. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about K levels in prosthetic components and a little bit about the components that fit those K levels. So here is your course description, pretty basic. And here are the learning objectives. So what I want to emphasize here is that I don't think my job is to turn you into prosthetists, right? Uh, there's a reason why we went to PT school or PTA school and didn't go to prosthetist school. Um, that's their job, I think, is to really know uh, the details of the components that are on the market, what they do, what they don't do, share that with you as therapists. Our job is to know our patients, right? To understand their current function, their previous function, and their future function, make recommendations to prosthetists and to physicians in general terms about that. If you are one of those therapists who really geeks out on knowing all this stuff about what's on the market, that's great. Go crazy. The prosthetist would love to talk to you about it. Um, but that's not necessarily going to be the focus here. So I will make, I'll show a few components. I'll talk about a few components. By no means is it a laundry list of what's out there, nor does it represent items that your local prosthetist likes using or has had some really good results with. So keep in mind that there are lots of manufacturers out there. There are lots of feet on the market, lots of knees on the market. Um, and this is merely a, a smattering. So I teach this content to DPT students and I, I try to keep it as broad as possible as well. So that's kind of going to be my approach. A lot of you might have seen, might have, might have learned this already in your PT program uh, and this will be a refresher for you. So at the end, we'll talk about documentation, um, a little bit um, about insurance uh, without going into detail about that as well, okay? So here we go. What are K levels? So some of you might already know, but we learned in doing a lot of online teaching over the last uh, several months with COVID and saying the term K level over and over again, we had a lot of people say, what are K levels? And so we realized that we made the presumption that people knew what this was. So this, the, the term K is a prosthetist specific term, I try not to use that in my documentation, um, but what they really are Medicare uh, functional classification levels. So Medicare developed them in the 90s and the concept was to categorize components based on patient prognostication of function, right? Current function or future function. 
So, uh, so that's the goal was to avoid giving a really, really fancy, expensive knee or foot to uh, an elderly person who wouldn't be able to use it properly. Or in fact, it might be dangerous for that patient. So that was the original plan. Obviously, CMS really wanted to control costs, let's be honest, right? That was really the, you know, the initial basis um, of this whole conversation. So when we say K level, there are five levels, and this is common parlance with prosthetists. Um, it may not be as common among the therapy world, but, uh, but you can feel free to use this terminology with your practitioners, with the prosthetists with whom you work most closely, with physicians. Physicians might not know either uh, what these K levels are. So again, if you don't understand how it completely applies to your, the patient in front of you, don't hesitate uh, to talk to your prosthetist. So who determines K levels uh, and what are some factors, right? So here's just a laundry list of things that you would consider as therapists, we consider this in our evaluations anyway, right? We're looking at health and comorbidities, weight, activity level, previous level of function, future level of function or expected. Um, what is their motivation? That seems kind of interesting, but that's actually a pretty powerful word. So if your patient is really motivated to learn to use a prosthesis, you want to put that in your note. That's, that's actually really powerful language. Um, how close they are to the prosthetist, right? So let's say your patient lives in a really rural area. And they're not going to be able to get in to see the prosthetist very often then maybe they don't want something that's really fancy that will require a lot of adjustments, um, et cetera. So that's something to, to keep in mind. And then residual limb factors. So some residual limbs might not work with all components for a variety of reasons. Generally speaking, again, in our normal evaluation on a regular patient, non-amputee, we're asking a lot of these questions already, right? So this should not be new. Um, but understanding some of the areas in which to focus as you are contributing to the conversation about future function. So the physical therapist note is as important as anybody else's note in justifying the kind of leg that the patient will get, uh, will be approved by their insurance company moving forward. And then who decides? So this is a, this should be a collaborative discussion. It should be the physician, the prosthetist, and the physical therapist, right? Best case scenario. So I have the fortune to have been a part of an amputee clinic at a level one trauma hospital for many years where I might have been the PT or one of my buddies was the PT with a PM&R physician and a, a local prosthetist. And the patients weren't obligated to use that prosthetist but that prosthetist was able to, uh, to talk about his or her own patients or to comment on issues that, that a patient uh, was struggling with in the rehab process. So to everybody coming together and agreeing on a K level, really important, really helpful. So everybody's documentation is consistent with what the patient really should get, where they fall, and, and that makes a stronger case uh, to the insurance company for components actually being approved. So that's the best case scenario. Now, I didn't put the patient in there, right? And as therapists, we're really clued into patient choice and patient participation in their own rehab and learning. And I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. The problem is this is pretty overwhelming for patients, especially new amputees. So just for the funsies, try Googling prosthetic feet and it'll blow your mind, right? So the things that are on the market, patients can't be expected to really grasp that when they're also healing and they're also dealing with the biopsychosocial aspects of having an amputation, the grieving process. You can't expect the patient to come into the prosthetist and say, I would like this foot. That's my favorite one on the website, right? It does not work like Amazon. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why um, we might inform the patient, but the patient is really going to need our guidance. And especially once the K level is determined, the guidance of the prosthetist to then say, I recommend this foot or I recommend this knee for you 
out of the three things I could choose from or the four or five things I could choose from, here's why, right? So all of those different features of these different prosthetic components are way too many uh, for the likes of me to, to remember or understand. Um, so that's why I really wanna rely on the, on the prosthetist for that information. So I might be the one who, who says to the prosthetist, wow, I really question if this patient's going to be able to get back to what they were doing before, here's why from a PT perspective. And then that generates the conversation from the prosthetist perspective to select a, a component that might work well for the patient. I also really enjoy having PM&R docs involved in this process. So you, not all PM&R docs are equal in their understanding of this patient population, right? That's okay, they can learn uh, and contribute to the conversation. They certainly understand prognostication, right? Which means that we can have a really great conversation about it. So I'm a big picture girl. Here's what I want you to think about as we're going through the K levels. This is a progression from stability to mobility, right? So think about our patients who need the most stability, a walker for example, is more stable than a cane. So we're already thinking this way, and you know that prosthetic components do the same thing, right? So for somebody who needs more stability, external stability, a prosthetic foot can provide that for them. They can't handle too many degrees of freedom, right? Or they fall down, we don't want that. But as patients progress in their ability, or they already were pretty able to begin with, then they're going to, uh, to be able to use a more mobile foot or a more mobile knee that's more responsive, gives them some energy return, and they're not gonna fall down. In fact, they're going to walk better. So that's the general concept that I want you to consider as we're going through um, these components, okay? So K0, this is the first K level. Um, the, the K0 patient is not a prosthetic candidate. And the, the language that I think is really powerful, no ability or potential to transfer with or without assistance, prosthesis will not enhance quality of life or mobility. So that language helps you understand who fits into this category, but it also is very helpful language to include in your documentation if you feel the need, right? Now, I think it's really tricky to make the distinction between a K0 and the next K level, which is a one, to say, I don't think you're appropriate for a prosthesis, right? For the person who thinks they're going to get one, wow, that's tricky, right? So, so we wanna make sure that we're also thinking about their motivation. Are they on the fence of, maybe they really are on the fence between a K0 and a K1, and we can highlight some reasons why we think they might succeed with a prosthesis, might be able to learn to use a prosthesis, right? So an example of a couple K0 patients I've encountered, our first thought is, oh, here's someone who's bed bound and they can't be expected to transfer even with you know, partial assistance, right? So uh, you know, having a prosthesis isn't going to help them transfer or any minimal household ambulation. So that, that's one person. The other people I've thought about, that I've encountered bilateral transfem patients who have had their amputation sometime previously, like over a year, had hip flexion contractures of 25 to 30 degrees bilat. They got a wild hair and decided, I would like to walk. Well, this is really gonna be hard because standing up, you got in order to walk, guess what? You have to stand up first. Standing up with bilateral transfem prostheses without parallel bars to haul yourself up on, pretty darn hard, right? So those were some patients that I've seen in the past whom I thought I was really on the fence about. So hopefully that gives you some ideas. Again, you don't want, you're not gonna be making this decision by yourself, if that makes sense, right? Okay, now we move on to K1. So now we get into the business of ambulation. So the K1, typical household ambulator, you see we have a walker in the picture, this person has the ability or potential, right? So ability without a prosthesis potentially, potential with a prosthesis, to use a prosthesis for transfers or ambulation on level surfaces at a fixed cadence. So 
household ambulator, right? This patient's not walking outside their home with their prosthesis other than perhaps to get into the car, right? Where then they would park really close to a store. Uh, maybe somebody brings a scooter to them or they're able to get to the scoot where the scooters are kept in the front of a store. Um, but that's all the effort that they have, right? So this person requires a fair amount of external stability, hence the concept of a, a foot that is also inherently stable. So, um, so the, the other thing to think, well here, let me just move on, sorry. <laughs> the therapy implications, patient will require more external stability from a prosthetic device due to decreased inherent balance control. So think about outcomes measures that might tell you that this patient needs, um, it would, would be of K level um, need for external stability. So we've got some different uh, outcomes measures that we can use, but even the five times sit to stand, let's say, if somebody cannot stand independently without a prosthesis, so they have an intact leg, and they can't stand a transfer using a walker from a chair, their wheelchair, et cetera, even just a stand, not necessarily to do a stand pivot, that tells you something, right? Or if you think they can't do it today, but give them a prosthesis, they will be able to build power, they'll be able to do it, then you know that you can go ahead and, and, and recommend that for them. So on the component slide, um, I, I'm sorry, on the previous slide, I have a couple of examples of feet and knees. Again, don't get too hung up on those. You wanna to talk to your local practitioner about what they use, right? So on, on this slide, I do have a satch foot and I think it's important to show uh, because just the cross section of the picture doesn't show you enough. So uh, a lot of the prosthetists with whom I work will use this foot almost exclusively for K1 patients. Um, there are so also are uh, single axis feet, so that's just dorsiflexion and plantar flexion only. Again, you're going to run into some pretty strong opinions from prosthetists about what they use and why they use it. That's great, right? The more that you can learn about that or defer to them based on the patient in front of both of you, that's, that's great. But I like showing the satch foot just because the one in the picture is harder to tell. So you'll see there's a wedge, a foam wedge here, and there are no articulations in this foot. So super simple. It takes a lot to break one of these. Heel strike, your eccentric control that would normally occur in the uh, anterior tib gastroc complex, right? It's we're slowly lowering the toe as, the, as tibial progression happens that's somewhat absorbed by this foam section, right? So it's like walking in ski boots with a soft heel, right? So that absorbs a little bit of that force and then you are able to move forward a little more slowly. Remember, the person using this foot is probably also gonna be on a walker, right? So they're not trying to uh, really hoof it down the street necessarily. So there are also a couple of knees on there, again, um, really stable knees, right? We get to the transfem patient who's a K1, they're going to have a, a knee probably that has a locking mechanism on it, um, or it locks in standing and they have a bail lock that they pull to unlock so that they can sit down. But so that's the general concept there, um, extremely stable. Then we go on to K2. So your K2s are your limited community ambulators the ability or potential for ambulation and can traverse low level environmental barriers, curbs, stairs, or uneven surfaces will not be able to vary cadence. That's a pretty strong term that you can use in your documentation. Will likely require an assistive device most of the time, if not all of the time. So now start thinking about your long-term goals for this patient in outpatient. So let's say you've written 12-week goals and you think by the time 12 weeks rolls around, this per I'm probably going to discharge this person with their prosthesis or I will be close. If you wrote a long-term goal that they're going to need to use a cane or a walker, they're a K2. That makes sense, right? So the insurance company is going to look at your goals and say, your goal has to say that they can walk without a device. Now we know that it might take somebody more than 12 weeks to be doing that 100% of the time, right? But 
uh, we can kind of be a little bit uh, more assertive in our goal writing to make sure uh, that we're getting people the devices that they need. Uh, so those are some things that are, that are really important as well. So then if you look at the therapy implications, patients are somewhat more mobile, still require some external stability, right? There is a video link there. I won't go through it during this, uh, during this presentation, but what I like about it is that it shows you the mechanics of some of these, some of these feet. There's a, another link later as well. So I brought out um, the, uh, the balance S foot. This um, is a foot that our, a K2 foot that our prosthetists like a lot. Again, ask your local prosthetist. So you see where we're going with this. K2, the next level is K3, independent walking. The big, big difference in construction of feet between K2 and K3 is carbon fiber. So you don't use any carbon fiber in a K2 foot. K3 feet and K4 feet are all carbon fiber. That's your energy return. So this is a composite material, but our folks are really liking it a lot. And then you'll see there's a split toe and there's where you get your medial lateral range of motion, right? You get a little bit of medial lateral allowance for uneven surfaces, right? I stepped on a rock or I'm walking on a gravel driveway and you get a little bit of that that's normal in the ankle, right? Imagine putting medial lateral control on your K1 patient, that's when they're gonna fall down. So that's another degree of freedom, if that makes sense. The other thing that, um, that I wanna point out on this foot, this is a torsion adapter, which often is added after market to other feet for higher level patients. So think about, standing with your feet planted. Maybe you're checking out at the grocery store and you're doing this number to reach your groceries and put them on the, um, on the scanner or something like that. So, uh, so that's where, I mean, our ankles give us this torsion in our daily lives, we just don't think about it. So that's what I like a lot um, about this foot, what our folks are liking. Again, my goal isn't to highlight a particular product, but to suggest that you talk to your prosthetist about it. Hey, after this in-service, maybe what you're gonna say is, what do you guys like for K2s, right? What are you liking right now? What, can, what, what does the patient get out of that particular foot? I'll also tell you that manufacturers' websites have a lot of really good information about specific components that tell us what the foot or what the knee does. And if you don't understand some of the language on the websites, then you know, guess what I'm gonna say, right? Ask, ask your local provider to give you a little bit more detail about it or to explain it to you. Again, there's a whole lot to know about these. Um, so some feet slow tibial progression and others might allow more tibial progression. Others might have different adjustment options for uh, straight plane motion. I mean, there's all kinds of things that they can do. It's pretty amazing. So again, I don't wanna get um, into too much detail about that. I also um, have a couple knees here. So there, a lot of the K2 knees can also be used for K1 or s some of them can. Again, that's going to be uh, dependent um, on your patient's ability and what the prosthetist feels comfortable putting on them. <clears throat> Okay, now for the more mobile folks. So I mentioned K3 already, unlimited community ambulator. So you can start to see some of the language that you can use in your own documentation without saying this person's a K1, right? I, I don't feel like that's our place as therapists to use that language, but goodness gracious, we can use functional language, right? That's our bailiwick. So unlimited community ambulator, ability or potential for ambulation with, here's the key, variable cadence, that's a big deal, um, and able to traverse most environmental barriers will not require an assistive device. So they can vary their cadence, speed up in a crowd, right? Or, oh, the, here's the bus stop and here's the bus. I need to hurry up to get to it. Or somebody cuts me off, I can stop really quickly, right? Without falling down or I can slow down. I can speed up to match the cadence of the person I'm walking with, for example. Uh, so this is a normal, active adult using normal locomotion, and that's, that's what the K3 level is. So then if we look to the components, normal activity levels, 
So you need components that are responsive and allow negotiation of all of these environmental barriers, right? This is where you really start to get into a lot of choices. Different manufacturers offering different selections and they all have a little wrinkle, right? Um, and again, you're going to find uh, variable opinions among your prosthetist buddies about what they're going to recommend for any particular patient. So the, I'll stay on this slide for a moment because I wanna highlight dynamic response. So I mentioned earlier for K2, big difference, no carbon, carbon in the feet, carbon fiber. So that's what it gives you is dynamic response. And so now what we're trying to do is mimic the gastroc the energy storage uh, in the Achilles tendon to then release energy on toe off, right? So that's the big picture concept. And that's what these feet are trying to do. The more carbon, the more dynamic response, right? So I'll, I'll explain that here in a, in a moment. Um, and then from a knee perspective, this is when we start going beyond a, a knee that doesn't have any kind of, it's a mechanical knee, right? That's how it generates resistance. We go from that in K1 and K2 to knees that, are, um, that have either a, a pneumatic or hydraulic system for resistance. There are other, other fancy things out there on the market. Um, and then also you can have a microprocessor component added on the knee as well, right? So that adds a different level. My word is always fancy because I, that just kind of toss all this stuff into that, into that same category. So again, those are some, some suggestions there. Um, I'm also seeing more um, four-bar knees. So for those of you who are unfamiliar I didn't um, I didn't actually bring any I brought some knees but they don't make a lot of sense on the on the camera I just realized but so look at the pictures on the slide um, so on the right side so you a polycentric knee a four bar knee is often more stable in extension but you can have a four bar knee that is a k1 or k2 knee so it doesn't have any pneumatic or hydraulic resistance or you can have one that does have pneumatic or hydraulic resistance. Once you move to a microprocessor knee, it's single axis only. So that's, uh, but then you can also have all these other add-ons, right? So that's where things start to get uh, a little confusing. If you look on the left of the, of the picture, you'll see what's a short, what's called a short keel foot versus the cheetah is a long keel. So this isn't a cheetah, it just happens to be the one that I had. Remember I mentioned more carbon fiber, more energy return. That's why the, the longer keel feet give you more of that energy return. The shorter keel feet accommodate for all kinds of other things, right? So this particular foot is a hydraulic foot. So that's where uh, you're actually getting some uh, some control over the mobility of the foot with a hydraulic unit that can be adjusted and it allows for a really smooth heel to toe motion. These, these are a little newer on the market. Um, as a PT, uh, I only saw a few of these um, in my practice that were just coming on. So now they're kind of hot. Uh, so uh, definitely a topic to talk to your, uh, your practitioner about. Also note that this particular foot has a split toe and a split heel. So again, think medial lateral control, right? I'm walking on a gravel driveway, I hit a rock, I accommodate with that through the split heel, I come through the toe, I accommodate, etc. right? So you'll, you will see that more on the higher level feet. <clears throat> So um, then we get to K4s, okay? So K4, uh, it, there's re it seems like the running feet and running knees are going to be totally different from the K3 components, not necessarily. So there are a lot of K3 components on which people can run, right? So if you've got a, 
um, weekend warrior patient, or, you know, somebody who's relatively active, or maybe they have a sedentary job, but they want to be able to run, or they play with their kids in the yard, they want to be able to do that, that's a great conversation to have with the prosthetist. The prosthetist asks a lot of these same questions about function and previous mobility as we do as PTs in an in evaluation, but I have found that we focus on function even more. We often find out things that the prosthetist didn't find out, at least in my limited experience, about somebody's function in the past, and then our ability to prognosticate about their function in the future. So that, that's again why I really think having these conversations uh, are really important. So it doesn't mean that a prosthetist can't recommend a K-level without the in input of a PT, uh, but oh my gosh, does it work a lot better um, in the long run. So for K-level or for K-4 components, now we're talking about, you know, obviously higher impact things. So again, there are a few things that are probably specifically K-4. I don't focus on that a lot because, um, I, again, I consider that my best case scenario, your first prosthesis isn't a fancy cheetah running leg, right? This particular foot is also fine for walking, right? It's got a heel on it. A lot of the big running feet, you will see um, the blade, right? So in the picture, you see the cheetah blade, which really truly is a running foot. So if you've ever watched uh, somebody in the Paralympics walk, with those feet, their walking is really crazy, right? Because uh, they're not getting a heel strike, but they're not supposed to get a heel strike when they're running on a competitive level. So that's really the difference. So obviously not somebody's first foot, but the prosthetist needs to know that this is a patient who might eventually want some higher level components for some more activity um, of an athletic nature, right? So great, great discussion there to have. Um, all right, so now documentation. I wanna spend a minute here because I think it's important for, for you to see how we take this K-level information and include it into a patient note. So this is just an example. Mrs. Ms. Jones presents with good range of motion and functional strength, right? I feel like I'm teaching our DPT students, you don't need to regurgitate your O, that's not the point. But what we're trying to do is provide our opinion of what we found in the O, of course, for prognostication. So good range of motion and functional strength. She's motivated, here you go, to learn to use a prosthesis so she can return to work and her active lifestyle. Her current independence with functional mobility. So in this particular example, I'm intending to talk about a patient who is post-amputation pre-prosthetic. So the, the more able they are to transfer independently, to ambulate independently, maybe a walker if they need that for whatever reason, or better case scenario crutches, right? If they're really more mobile pre-prosthetic, they've got great balance on their other leg and also they've got great core control for balance. So noting where people are in their pre-prosthetic balance tells you how they're going to be with a prosthesis and uh, for the most part, right? So, uh, um, so that's going to be, but she has enough balance to use a prosthesis consistently without an assistive device. She has the potential, here's how you work potential in, to learn to vary her cadence and the potential to be an unlimited community ambulator. K-level, right? So that's a three, a patient who's a three. So I've had a couple interesting discussions with the, uh, the people in our company who manage insurance claims, right? So very black and white. And, and in, I had this really funny discussion with a gal who said, you can't, you can't objectify potential. And I was like, we do it all the time, right? That's why we have goals. Short-term goals and long-term goals are all about patient's potential. We're consistently evaluating and making an educated prognosis about someone's future potential as PTs, regardless of whether or not they're an amputee, right? That is just our bread and butter. So, uh, so I, 
it just kind of made me laugh, but I, I needed to try to, to show her how it can be done, right? So I will say that my documentation on multiple occasions has justified a K3 component for a patient who was on the fence between K2 and K3. I personally think that that's the trickiest balance between K2 and K3. What if you have somebody who right now is pretty down, right? The best example I can give is the patient who's had a diabetic foot ulcer for a while, so they were, they were down, they were less ambulatory, or they were in a wheelchair for several months. So now they, they really are weak, and we wonder, are they going to be able to get back to being an unlimited community ambulator? Maybe there are some other reasons why we expect that they're going to be a K2. But have I been surprised where I've taken some people who were pretty clearly K2s, put a K, K2 foot on them, and then they, it's, too, it's too limited for them, right? They just they surprise you. They crush it. And then they need to move on to uh, transition to K3 componentry. I've seen that happen for transfem level patients as well. So there's an insurance company I know of that will only provide a K2 knee to a, tra a new transfem amputee who lost their leg because of disease, right? Because they they think, oh, you're always going to be a K2. You, you're never going to make it back because you have all these pre-existing conditions that mean that you have lower ability or lower potential. Uh, but that's not always true, right? I've seen some people just really surprise me and surprise the prosthetist. That's what it's all about. So that might make you ask the question, can somebody move from a K2 to a K3? Yes. And the way they do it is documentation, right? Medical necessity. So you have to show that there's a, a medically necessary reason for them to progress in components. If you've got this kind of patient, I certainly hope you're working with the prosthetist because they're trying to do the same thing. They want the best for the patient, right? So they want to be able to progress that patient and give them the best componentry that they can to get to a more normalized gait. Here's another interesting wrinkle with K levels. The K3 patients, get better components, more mobile components than the K2 patients. But think about this diabetic patient, their other foot is at greater risk for amputation. And yet we're putting them in a lower mobility, a lower mobility foot because we think they need that. But what does that mean? They're going to put more pressure on their intact foot that is at greater risk. So if you've got that patient who really is on the fence between K2 and K3 and with, in conversation with the physician and the prosthetist, you all feel there are enough factors that indicate this person might do really well with K3 componentry, then I would go with K3 componentry and motivation might be the key there. Here's the other key, outcomes measures. Here's another reason to be using outcomes measures as much as possible to show progression in patients, but also to justify component changes, right? So this is just a, a list of some of the, um, of the outcomes measures that are validated in the amputee population. For those of you who are familiar with the AMP, the amputee mobility predictor, there is also a no pro version of that, right? So you get your, your patient, you're evaluating your patient pre-prosthetic, you can do this test that if you are on the fence and you're not sure, you're gonna see in front of your eyes whether or not they have the best sitting balance, whether or not their standing balance is adequate. Can they take a step hopping on the walker, right? All of those things are giving you that objective measure that back up all of the other things that you found in your, the normal course of your evaluation with the patient. Um, obviously the six minute walk test, I, I'm not going to do that or the two minute walk test without a prosthesis, right? But once they get a prosthesis, that gives you a really great baseline on their ability to walk, uh, some distance with the prosthesis. I don't have the 10 meter walk test on here, but that's also perfectly valid. The tug, pretty fantastic. 
part of the problem with the tug is standing up in the first place from a seat, right? So we know that some of our lower level patients, maybe they take half of the tug time just standing up from sit to stand. Then they do okay once they get going. Well, that tells us something. I haven't indicated the C-tug here. For those of you familiar with the C-tug, that breaks down the tug and it really further isolates these pieces and parts of the function so that you know, oh, the real problem is the turn, right? I need to spend more time working on turns during my evaluation or during my treatment sessions. Uh, so those are some of the biggest physical performance measures that are available. Patient report measures, there are others, but the plus M is specifically for patients wearing a prosthesis. That is available free online, by the way. There is a seven item version and a 12 item version, and it really deals with functional tasks. So I will use it to measure progress, but I will also use it to help me, help guide me toward later goals. Patients really doing well with the initial goals I set, where are we still stuck, right? Is it prolonged walking? Is it uneven surfaces? Is it carrying something while you're walking? All kinds of, of little bits of info that you can get out of the plus M. And then also the ABC, we're all familiar with the ABC, also validated in this patient population. And it can give us some specific ideas, again, of the pieces and parts of balance that are most challenging for our patients. So I, that's really where it's at, right? We wanna justify what we're doing and where we can. We wanna do it with an objective measure and that backs up what we were seeing already. And then you share that information with a prosthetist and again, that enriches your conversation. So I have not talked in gory detail about all the fancy things that knees can do or feet can do, right? That really wasn't the purpose of this particular presentation. Uh, but again, that's really where your local prosthetist can, can take it and run with it. You might learn about specific fancy components patient by patient, or uh, you might wanna attend other uh, continuing education that talks more about components. But there are lots of resources out there for you. So for now, I'll turn it back over uh, to your local folks and they will answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much for attending today.